Hey, everybody, and welcome to Out in Comics Year 33, uh, which we've subtitled Virtually Yours. Uh, we've got a great lineup here today. Um, we always try to have a really diverse lineup for the Out in Comics panel. Uh, some of the folks you'll see here today are long-term comic book people. Some of them are newer. Some cross over into Hollywood. Some are more indie-oriented. We do have all LGBT and Q represented today. And for the next hour, we're going to bring it. And hopefully, uh, you'll have a great time. Uh, just to give you a little bit of history on Out in Comics, this is the comic world's longest running panel. Uh, this is year 33, and we're entering our virtual age with Comic Con at home. My special guests here today uh, are Chris Cooper. Um, and uh, I, although none of us are wearing masks today, I did bring a special mask for Chris. Uh -oh. um, <laughs> you, may, you may recognize Chris not because he's Hawkman, <laughs> but, but Chris is probably the world's most famous birder. Uh, right now, but in the past when he wasn't fighting Karen in the in uh, New York Central Park He was the writer of series such as Darkhold, Star Trek, Starfleet Academy, and Marvel The Independent, independent Comic, Queer Nation, and he's the man who uh, Single-handedly sunk the Marvel swimsuit specials, but I think he'll probably talk about that later. Hi, Chris Welcome Hi. Uh, Next we have Noelle Stevenson and um, she is, she, her career rise has been meteoric. Uh, she is the Eisner and Glad Media Award-winning New York Times best-selling writer of Nimona and Lumberjanes. Uh, she's the author of The Fire Goes Out, a memoir in pictures. And of late, she has been the much-heralded executive producer and showrunner of DreamWorks she and The Princesses of Power. So big hand to Noel Stevenson. I hope you at home are clapping for these people. You can clap while we do this, right? Yay! Yay. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for having me. <laughs> uh, next up, we've got Tim Sheridan, uh, who is a kind of a newcomer to some of you maybe, but, um, but is arriving really fast and very loud on the scene. Uh, he's a writer for WB Animation and Netflix. Uh, his credits include DC Superhero Girls, Justice League Action, Scooby-Doo, Teen Titans Go, uh, the movies Reign of Superman, Death, The Death and Return of Superman, and the upcoming Superman Man of Tomorrow, uh, as well as Netflix's upcoming Masters of the Universe Revelation. So uh, howdy to uh, Tim Sheridan. Hi, thanks for having me. And finally, uh, we have Hazel Nulevent who is a Portland-raised, uh, but now lives in Queens, uh, cartoonist. Their comics include the graphic novellas If This Be Sin and Sugartown, and the recent graphic, no uh, graphic memoir No Ivy League. She's edited and published the anthologies Chainmail B Bikini, an anthology of women gamers, and Comics for Choice, and co-edited the Eisner-winning anthology Puerto Rico Strong. She's also the recipient of an Ignatz, Zurich, and Prism Grant Awards. So welcome to Hazel. Hey, thanks for having me. All right, so there we have kind of a quick introduction to everyone, but I'm going to let them tell you a little bit more about themselves in this question. When I asked you to be on this panel, the panel is called Out in Comics. It used to be called Gaze in Comics. So what I'd like you to do is kind of, in talking about your career, address what does out in comics mean to you? Um, how has being LGBTQ affected your career, your art, uh, gay characters you may have written or drawn, uh, and things in your careers? And we're going to start out with Chris. Uh, great question. I'll be as concise as possible. Um, to me, being out in comics means two things. You're both out yourself as a working professional, but you're also bringing that perspective to your work. And you know, most often, I think for most of us, that means you're, you're including 
uh, LGBTQ themes and characters. Um, so um, how did I do that in my career? And, and the reason why, <laughs> we have to keep in mind that I am almost certainly the oldest person here on this panel, at least for the moment. Um, so why is anybody at all interested in, in what I'm doing? It's because um, somebody wouldn't leash their dog and it led to that person going racial. And now because of this viral explosion, everyone's re-examining my, my uh, comic book career from uh, two decades ago. Um, but it, <laughs> for those of you who can't see, Andy is holding up a Hawkman mask. Um, but it, it's an interesting to talk about because it was an interesting time to be uh, sort of uh, uh, um, pioneering in some respects uh, the whole gays in comics thing, the whole queers in comics thing. So what did I do? Um, I was out at Marvel. I was not the first openly gay person at Marvel. Incredibly annoyingly, Kelly Corvasi beat me to the punch. He was uh, also an assistant editor and he was out and I want to smack him senseless for denying me my rightful crown. Um, but I can't smack him too hard because he's the whole reason why I got a job. We worked out at the same gym, a predominantly gay gym in New York City that doesn't exist anymore. But he, uh, he told me that a job was opening up at Marvel and I'm like, get me in there because I want to I wanna, I wanna, I wanna, uh, try out for the job. So, and I got the job and that started my career. So thank you, Kelly. Um, Characters I created um, that are LGBTQ. Um, principal one is, uh, ones are Victoria Montesi in the comic book series Darkhold, which was uh, a horror comic I created for Marvel. And uh, Vicky was the heir of a long line of Montesis who guarded the world against the evil of the ultimate book of evil spells, the Darkhold. And she was supposed to be born male to become a priest and continue with the line of priests defending the world against uh, uh, the dark old. And instead, she was born a woman and a lesbian. And her dad was not happy about that twist of fate. Um, but she had a lover who gets blown up in the first issue, but survives. Um, but she's a paraplegic thereafter. Um, so uh, she, has, she has her share of tragedy, as every comic book hero does. Um, and then the other big character I created was Yoshi Mishima. Uh, and that was in the comic book Star Trek Starfleet Academy, who was the first human uh, gay character in the Star Trek universe. Now, sadly, Star Trek comics are not canon. So uh, it doesn't really count, I guess, in, in, in the larger scheme of things as far as uh, um, purists are concerned. But it was tremendous fun to do, and I was glad I got to do it. Um, uh, I was also the assistant editor on um, Alpha Flight 106 the infamous issue in which North Star came out of the closet. And there are stories I could tell about that for days. Um, it was... <laughs> yeah, we're all like... <laughs> no, no, I don't, I don't want to, I don't, don't want to use up all the oxygen. So, you know, maybe if there's time at the end, we'll come back to that. But there were definitely stories to be told. Um, and um, the other thing is, oh, Marvel Swimsuit. Um, yes, I am the man who single-handedly tanked Marvel Swimsuit because they gave me Marvel Swimsuit. And I'm like, you know I'm gay, right? Because, mm -hmm. you know, it's like this breasts and butts and skimpy outfits, you know, cheesecake thing galore. And I'm like, okay, you give this to me. It's going to be 50-50 male, female. <laughs> uh, number one, to inoculate us from charges of sexism. And number two, because it's what I want to see. Um, and I did it, and there was never a Marvel swimsuit issue after that. <laughs> Some of those guys were hot. <laughs> so that's it. All right. So Noel, um, you you came into the industry just like like a, a whirlwind. Um, so and and as I recall, you've been out from day one. But day one wasn't that long ago. So, so talk about what does out in comics mean in your career for both comics and Hollywood? I, I actually wasn't out from the beginning, which is really interesting because I feel like I've had a lot of like queer stories and characters in everything I do. But uh, I don't know. I don't know if I, it was one of those things where everyone was just like kind of 
like waiting for it to happen. Um, and then I, but I was, I was 25 when I officially, officially came out. Um, and just up until then, I was just like, well, maybe I'm just a straight woman who just you know, loves writing gay stories. Who knows? I can be that, you know? <laughs> um, but I mean, I really think that comics was kind of, uh, my, my path to learning to accept myself and learning, learning about myself in general. Um, uh, yeah, so it started with Nimona, which has a prominent, um, there's only like four characters in it, but, you know, all of them are, well, I mean, all of them are gay. <laughs> but uh, there's a prominent um, relationship between a villain and a hero, both of them male. Um, not super overt, but it is like a big, um, a big part of that story. And it, that was the, that was my first book. That was the comic that I started when I was 19. And a long way still from, you know, learning, you know, that I was a lesbian, that, you know, just who I was in general. Um, my next uh, book was a collaboration. I was uh, a part of the Lumberjane series, um, along with Grace Ellis, Brooklyn Allen, and Shannon Waters. And so that was a very, it was a, um, you know, there's a, not only is there a trans girl as the main character, but there are two girls who have a crush on each other from, you know, issue one. And that was really exciting because it's an all ages comic book and there hadn't really been a lot of queer characters in all ages comics at that point. Um, and just right away, you know, we knew that we wanted that to be something that was kind of just very, very clear um, and, and very like a very central part of that uh, comic. Um, and then, uh, so I think that like, I was definitely at this point, like, like learning about myself. I was definitely like, maybe there's some hints about, uh, about who I really am, uh, maybe in the stories that I'm interested in. Um, but I, I came out in 2015 or 2016, uh, around the same time that I started on she -Ra. Um, and so Shira really, you know, not only is the original show from 1987 just incredibly, incredibly gay, and I, you know, I felt like I had to continue that legacy. I think that Shira and He-Man have always been gay icons, and uh, wanted to bring that to to the present day. Um, so those have been those have been my stories. I think the queer aspect has always been a big part of it for me, but. I have not always been the most self-aware person, so I didn't realize how much it was reflecting on myself until until I reached a certain point. But I really do credit comics with kind of like like guiding me on that path and, and surrounding me with so many people who were, you know, so like proudly out and true to themselves. And, and I was so inspired by them and I wanted to be like them and I wanted to be sure of myself and the way that they were. Uh, so yeah, really comics was, was what, uh, what let me here. I, I have to say, as uh, I co-wrote Lou Scheimer's biography about Filmation Studios, which is the people who produced He-Man and She-Ra, and, uh, and Lou's daughter, Erica, who played Frosta on the show, is an out lesbian. And, you know, Lou and I talked a lot about if he were doing cartoons today, would he have featured queer characters? And he said, absolutely. And it was one of his frustrations that he never got to do that. Um, so, you know, it's funny because you say He-Man and She-Ra are pretty queer. And Tim will probably have some more to say about that as well. But the, uh, the intention of at least the producers and the people behind the scenes was that they would have done that then. It, they, they would have made it not coded then. Yeah. Um, I think my my impression, like watching the old like the old series, is like you know we have Spinnerel and Natasa and they're married in our show. But if you watch the original, they were kind of already married. Maybe they couldn't say that, but it's like it's doing everything but saying that they're married. Where they're like they're a bonded pair. They need each other. They're always together. All these things. So it's like not only is it chock full of rainbows and you know scantily clad muscle men and and curvy ladies in tights like and there's rainbows everywhere and unicorns it's like i i really do think that there was just like a very very str like strongly implied gay presence throughout the entire show and uh, you know i was really honored to you know be a part of that legacy in general great thank you we're gonna switch over to tim now uh tim how howdy um the uh you know people may be still learning your stuff uh you know at this point 
uh, because unfortunately people don't read writer credits on cartoons as much as we think they should. Um, but uh, but you've been really active at Warner Brothers, and there's rumors that you may be moving into comics. Um, and so so talk to me about the uh, what is being out in comics and in comic related cartoons mean to you? You know, if I um, if I can take a, a sort of a moment of personal privilege to say, uh, I think what's it's funny when you say what does out in comics mean to me. I think about this panel and how I attended this panel at, oh. <laughs> in San Diego every year uh, for years. And, um, and I can't tell you what it meant for me out in the wilderness, not, uh, you know, ha not having a foothold in the business uh, yet to feel connected to it and to feel that there was a place for me in the business. And I think I'm so, uh, you know, congratulations on 33 years. I'm so glad that we're doing this uh, now. I can't believe you uh, asked me to, to, to take part. I will also say that I'm so, I can't believe the opportunity we have to do this virtually because I think about the kids who maybe can't get to San Diego or if they did get to San Diego, maybe they wouldn't feel comfortable. Maybe they it, maybe going into that room with their with their maybe they're with, with their parents. I don't know. Maybe they're not out yet. They haven't figured things out. And this as an opportunity for them to uh, to see, you know, some successful, powerful uh, queer creators. Um, I yeah, I'm just really really happy to be here. Um, so thank you. Thank you. Um, and now, animation is not all She-Ra and the Princesses of Power. Uh, you know, we're, that is a wonderful and unique uh, thing that has happened. Um, and I'm so happy that we're here. And, and, and thank you, Noel, for all your work. Um, but it's still a very, um, if I can say, homophobic uh, part of, of Hollywood. Um, I think, you know, I'm still, you know, fighting the fights that I think a lot of people in comics fought 20 or 30 years ago, um, you know, to, to bring LGBTQ representation uh, into the stuff that I work on. And keep in mind, the things I typically work on are existing intellectual property and sometimes it can be a little bit difficult to, with, with the IP holders to get them to see things from another, another angle. Um, but I think that's part of the fight. I think it's part of what we have to do. No question, She-Ra and He-Man were the gayest shows on TV when I was a kid. Um, and we have to you know, pay attention to the huge uh, queer following of those, uh, uh, of those brands, of those characters. And, uh, and, 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 you know, make sure that they feel like we're reflecting uh, them when we, when we attack this IP now. Um, but I, I feel like there is still an opportunity. There's still a long way to go in animation. Um, I think that it is because often uh, people look at animation and even when it's not true, they think, oh, that's just for kids. So that's already an incorrect supposition. The second unfortunate part of that is they think that, a lot of people think that, you know, uh, LGBTQ uh, representation is not something we should be putting in front of kids. And uh, boy, I couldn't disagree more. And I think probably we all agree on that, 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 it's, that it is more important than ever uh, that we um, represent as much as we can. So. Um, I'm going to keep fighting that fight, uh, and uh, I think, you know, we all are, and I think hopefully there's going to be a lot more uh, Shiraz uh, on TV soon. Uh, but uh, yeah, that's, that's how I got here, and um, you know, out in comics was a big part of, uh, a big anchor for me, so thank you, Andy. Well, I got to say, too, that the, you know, DC Superhero Girls uh, which you've written a lot of, including the Lego ones, uh, you know, is a pretty uh, gay-friendly series. And in fact, they 
D, uh, this week, DC put out a, an image, a pride image with each of the, the characters, uh, which I thought was great. You know, let me clarify and say that, you know, any anything that I've seen of sort of the backwards uh, thinking in, in the business is not from the creators. Uh, the artists are the forward thinking, as usual, the, those that are forward thinking and trying to, you know, right the ship. It, you know, unfortunately, I think that, you know, it's it's sort of at the, the uh, the uh, the stakeholder, the executive level, the you know the those folks tend to be a little bit harder to sort of you know move, but um, but you know people like Warren Faust uh, on on DC Superhero Girls, you know you you couldn't ask for a better ally. I mean she's she's great. Great, good, good. Thank you, Tim. Uh, and Hazel, boy, you've had a smile on your face the whole time so far. <laughs> I've just been enjoying listening to everyone. Well, Hazel, you're the you're probably the 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 newest newest comer to the comic scene, you know, of this panel, and um, the most indie, I would say. I think so. Yeah, um, I have been drawing comics for about ten years, uh, but that's still within the range of the panel. Pretty new, but um, in terms of what being out in comics means to me. Um, I was pretty precocious and was like out as bisexual to my parents and my friends when I was 12. So by the time that I started really doing comics in my late teens, like it factored in. And um, I think it took me a little while to find my voice and what I wanted to write about. Like I was very attracted to the format of comics, but I wasn't really sure what I had to say with it. So I did a bunch of very experimental like zines with see through pages and stuff like that. Um, but then what I gravitated toward in terms of stories um, is doing historical nonfiction generally about like people in queer or trans history who either I admire or, you know, had an impact on the world we live in today. Like the first comics that I did that I think were really recognized that actually got the queer press grant from Prison Comics was If This Be Sin, which was a book that had a story about Gladys Bentley, who is a blues singer from the Harlem Renaissance, who was sort of, I don't think she would have called herself a drag king, but she definitely prefigured that by like performing in a top hat and tails and being very gender bendy. Um, and I'd also had a story about Wendy and Lisa, who were the guitarist and keyboard player from Prince's band, The Revolution, and also a lesbian couple. Um, and then aside from doing historical stuff, which tends to be about queer people, I've done a lot of autobio comics. And so my experience as, um, I mean, they just tended to be about relationships and dating and, you know, my experience being perceived as a woman and identifying as a bi woman um, is very much reflected in my autobio comics like Sugar Town. And nowadays I identify as trans masculine and non-binary, which, um, I haven't done too many comics about my personal trans experience yet, but um, I have some stuff in the works and I'm excited to share that with people too. Well, it is kind of interesting that comics, I think are the easiest place for people to explore uh, trans and gender identity politics because you can create out of out of whole cloth. You don't have to worry about production. You don't have to worry about uh, visuals. Everything is created in comics by you or your team. It is true that especially in terms of self-published comics, whether it's web comics or mini comics stuff in print, like there can potentially be absolutely no gatekeepers or you know there doesn't necessarily have to be anybody 
managing an IP who's editing how you're telling your story or you don't have to worry about casting and whatnot. Um, so yeah, it's possible to be pretty unfiltered and direct with it. And I think that definitely helps comics be a vanguard on certain topics and like also reflecting what Noel was saying, the comics community has been very important to me as my queer community. Like, you know, there's queer comics shows like FlameCon, Zine Fests, like that's, and that's how like I met also a ton of different trans and non-binary creators and people would have they on their name tags and like, you know, I could see people were, you know, doing it and being respected and it made it seem like more accessible and welcoming to come out than I think if I'd been in a different community. Uh, just the idea that we can have our own conventions now, that we can have educational weekends uh, and gatherings is, is you know, absolutely mind-boggling to me. And that's, that's one of the things that that has changed in this last 30 plus years. Yeah. So um, today's political and social climate is such that being out and creating out characters is both welcomed and shunned. Uh, in your career, have you had instances where you were encouraged not to be out or not to feature out characters or themes? And conversely, do the companies you work for now support you and out themes? Right now, I'm not uh, doing any comics, so that's about to change. More than that, I can't say. Well, uh, maybe I'll say more about it later, um, of one aspect of it. So I've got to talk about the past and how people react in the past. Um, no one tried to stop me from being out. They couldn't, you know, they don't have control over that. I do. Um, and so, um, you know, for me, it wasn't a question. And then they just had to deal with it or not as they saw fit. And, you know, and that was their problem. Um, so that was that. Um, as far as creating characters there, there was, well, here's where I can tell the Alpha Flight 106 story. <laughs> um, I'll tell it as succinctly as possible. Um, basically, anyone with half a brain, and certainly if you were gay, it, like from the first issue of Alpha Flight, you were like, North Star's gay. It was just there on the page, you know, subtly wink nod, but it was there. And so fast forward a couple of years, I'm no longer a reader. Now I'm on the inside working in Marvel Comics and I'm the assistant editor to Bobby Chase, who, is, who has become the editor of Alpha Flight. And we're looking to hire a writer and we settle on Scott Lobdell. This was actually before he um, became a very important X-Men writer. And I think actually it was his work on Alpha Flight that helped get him the X-Men jobs. Um, very talented guy with a lot of great ideas. And then he just had to call out, you know, the ideas that were going, eh, but he had a lot of really fantastic ideas that you could really run with. So we took him to lunch and, you know, everyone was just sitting around and we're like, well, you know, we could do this. Yeah, let's do this, great, let's do this, great. Just talking about the timeline. Um, and then, you know, Scott said, and yeah, you know, maybe it's time to bring Northstar out of the closet. And, you know, me and Bobby were both like, yeah, that makes sense. It's time to bring Northstar out of the closet. Now, you got to remember, this is 1992, I want to say. So it was a very different landscape than, you know, the landscape we have now. So the issue gets done, you know, and we send it off and it gets solicited. And in the solicitation, Widely, it's mentioned, you know, North Star comes out of the closet because that'll help sell the issue. So my phone rings and I pick it up and it's some guy, you know, calling from the press asking, oh, we saw the solicitation of North, North Star coming out of the closet in 106. I'm like, yeah, he's coming out of the closet in 106. And I'm like, oh, wow, okay. I'm like, fine, click. I turn to Bobby and I'm like, you know, oh, Bobby just got our first phone call about Alpha Flight 106. And Bobby's like, oh, just go down and tell uh, Pam and publicity, you know, what's going on because whenever we get press inquiries, we got to just let her know. And I'm like, okay. So I go trotting downstairs to Pam's office. And I'm like, hi, Pam. I just wanted to let you know we got our first phone call about Alpha Flight 106. And she goes, oh, what happens in Alpha Flight 106? And I'm like, oh, no, Star comes out of the closet. And the blood just drained out of her face. 
And she's like, I have to see a copy of that issue right away. And I'm like, oh, okay. So I go up, I your a copy of the issue, bring that. I, I haven't even gotten downstairs and she's calling, she's, she's like, I need seven more copies of that issue right away. And I'm like, oh, okay. <laughs> They tried to pull it from the printer. This is not Pam. Pam is just, you know, the PR person. But the high muckety mucks at Marvel at the time tried to pull it from the printer. Wow. Thank God, it was too late. It was already printed. Um, and um, at that point, though, they, they, they clamped down on us and they wouldn't let us talk to the press anymore, which was incredibly stupid. Because if the thing's coming out, you know, go with it, you know? Let right. us talk about it. You know, put your spin on it at least. But they just they just shut us down completely. Um, but anyway, it was a big deal anyway, and 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 how flight music went out. So that that's how they tried to stifle it. Um, when I did Vicky Montesi, uh, the lesbian character, they wouldn't let me uh, say she was a lesbian. So I had a panel where um, one of the uh, one uh, a smart mouth character says to her, "What Are you saying? You're a duck?" And then she grabs him by the collar and he says, "Thanks." <laughs> <laughs> so that was way of, uh, putting it, but I mean, if you read the issue, it was, you know, clear she had a lover. She goes to great lengths to try to save right. her lover when she's injured. Uh, with Yoshi Mishima in Starfleet, Starfleet Academy, they didn't try to stop me from putting in a gay character, but they changed who the gay character was. I was originally going to make it the squadron leader Matt Decker, and they didn't Paramount put the kibosh on that. They didn't want to. They felt that was something that if it was going to happen, should happen in the television shows, you know, just as the first black uh, uh, commander was done on the television shows, the first woman commander. So at that point, I had to change it, which was unfortunate because I, I had set up this whole dynamic where when Nog, the Ferengi, first joins uh, Starfleet Academy, it's Matt who's all, I don't, I don't know if I want to be on the same team as a Ferengi. And Ferengis have an incredibly sexist society and therefore are not open to, you know, LGBT stuff. And it was going to be a turnabout where Nog now was the one like, oh, I don't know if I want to be on the team with the gay guy. Um, so we didn't get to do that, but we got to do some other pretty wonderful stuff. And I, I have to say I'm pretty pleased with what happened. Now. Thank you. Uh, Noelle, what about you? Yeah, I mean, I think it's been um, a journey for me. Uh, definitely comics is like, um, I felt like I would always just pitch stuff and like, you know, I just figured if you were going to go for it, you had to really go for it. Um, but it's interesting. I felt like in every case, it, it's even when you expected people to be really chill with it, sometimes I, they were not comfortable with how, like, hard I wanted to go, like, right away. I, I actually, it's like, it still kind of bugs me a little bit. Like, the second issue of Lumberjanes, um, Mal and Molly are two, like, 12-year-old, 13-year-old, like, baby gays who have a crush on each other, but it's all in the background. But then Mal gets almost drowned in, in the river, and Molly tries to, like, give her mouth-to-mouth, -mouth, not knowing how to do it, ends up getting saved by another character jumping on Mal's stomach and expelling the water. Um, and then in the script, it was supposed to be kind of, like, the only thing that Mal really remembers is, like, did you just kiss me? And, like, they, like, talk about that a little bit. And I didn't, when the issue actually came out, the line was changed. Um, and so instead of saying, did you just kiss me? It's not like, did you just save me? Which was really interesting because, well, the kiss is still there. The like mouth to mouth is still there, but, and they've never changed it back. Like even in the like, um, the collected volumes, which is really interesting because I feel like it's like the, the comics are known for having gay characters, you know, like it's a, queer all ages comic that's like you know it's a big part of it and and I think that they have gone on to be able to be much more blatant with it but it was interesting that even like I, I think people get afraid when you like you know like no one wants to like be the first person to just like be out there in case it doesn't work in case they get in trouble especially executives um and so on she that was like it was something that I was very used to and it was something that like I've never had much chill as a person. Um, if, I, if I'm like interested in something, if I want something, I tend to just say it. Um, and so like, I, I really, really wanted gay characters and gay themes to be a big part of She-Ra. Um, and at first it looked like it was like, it was gonna happen, like it was gonna be supported. I had like, you know, there's like this prom in season one where it's just like, we wanted all the, you know, we just, we wanted gay characters to go together and dance together. And like, we wanted all these moments um, and it looked like it was gonna happen. And then 
the election of 2016 happened and everybody got real scared. Um, and so it became this like really, and it, it's really, I don't know, I, I feel like you, you gain the skill after a while to just be able to like sit in a room while people are telling you why like gay people shouldn't be like seen by children and like not take that personally and just kind of like keep like trying to like come at it from different angles being like, well, like, what about this? What about this? What about this? And it got to the point where I just started straight up kind of like just being like, no, that's not gay. That's, that's what friends do. That's what sisters do. It's, that's not, you're the one, are you, that's kind of homophobic that you think I can't write a straight friendship. Um, so I just, you know, after a while that, that became my tactic when uh, I wasn't able to like make progress in other ways. Um, but then again, like, it's like, it's there, it's like pretty, it's pretty clear to see. And, and I fought really hard for it every step of the way. Um, and I think once, once it's out there, once people are responding to it, and like, once you start hearing the stories and people are like, oh, I saw myself for the first time, I'm so happy, my, my like, you know, five-year-old kid is gay and he's so happy, like stuff like that, where, and, and then like, then everyone starts warming up, you know, then everyone starts being like, of course, of course you can do that. And so, um, I don't know, I, I guess it's just like, it's, you never, you never expect it to just be handed to you, even now, you know, I think my cover is pretty well blown at this point. Like everyone knows what I'm about and what I do, but I still don't just expect, you know, people to just be like, okay, sure. She was a lesbian now, whatever you say. Like, I don't expect that, but I, I don't stop trying for even stuff like that seems maybe like too much or too soon or whatever. I just think you, if you, if you're going to try, you got to try. Um, yeah, so I'm interested to see kind of how this, how this goes now that my bag of tricks has sort of been like found out. Um, and you know, I hope to just continue to, you know, not only continue creating the gay characters and gay stories that I'm passionate about, but also see other shows, other comics just be able to maybe go a little bit farther than they would otherwise be able to because of something we did on the show. Like that, that's really like, you always know that you're not just like, you're not just working on your own show at that point. You are, you're, you're trying to clear a path for people who are gonna come on your heels. And like, that's something that I always had in my mind while we were, while we were making the show. You're absolutely right. You, you have to push the envelope a little bit and get what you can get uh, because uh, the, you know, it's gonna make it a little bit easier for those coming up after you. Uh, when you send the elevator back down for them. But, you know, it's incredible, isn't it, how much people get on board when the press hits are really good and when the social media hits are, they're, you know, really rocking, you know? Like, you can really, if you do your, this is what, you know, if you do your job and you do it well, people will come to it and when people come to it, that's the thing everybody listens to. That's the thing that moves the needle. That's what she has done, certainly. You know, that's what, uh, what Alpha Flight did. You know, I think that, I think that um, uh, you know, I've, I have had uh, to, to come at things a little bit more covertly even than, than, you know, like what you've said, Noel. I mean, I, I wrote an entire movie that is subversively a coming out story um, that I think is a, you know, people are, someday if, if people ever see it, you know, it's, it's going to, um, it's going to sort of be a, a dog whistle for those who hear it, they're gonna know, oh, this is what this is. And I know that this is for me. Um, I think that, you know, there's something for everybody, but, um, but I had to sneak it past people. Uh, and, um, you know, I didn't talk about it. I just wrote it. And then we got into a situation where I ex had to explain it to someone uh, at the studio. And, and, uh, and once I did, they, they, I could see them freeze up. And they were thinking, oh no, you know, did we have, are we making, you know, a, a, a gay movie, uh, you know, with, 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 a, with you know, big IP. Um, and uh, what, are, what are we going to do? Um, 
you know, it, it hasn't, it, you know, it didn't stop any of the wheels. It hasn't stopped anything. So we'll see, we'll see what happens. Um, but you, you kind of do have to get creative still in, in, in our corner of, of the business and uh, make a little elbow room. And I think, you know, those things eventually change. Just like you guys changed it for us, to your point, Andy, you know, you made the elbow room for us to come in and, and, and maybe, you know, push that envelope a little bit further. Um, hopefully those folks who come after us will we'll get to do that. I, by the way, I, there's so much stuff I can't talk about. I, have, I am gagged with like NDAs to the hill and back. And um, I, I am now at a point in my career when I'm starting to get to do things with queer characters and, um, and you know, that aren't subversive. It doesn't have to be something I sneak past anyone. And I'm so proud and so happy to get to do it. And, uh, and there's a particular project I'm working on right now that is going to be, it's the, it's the thing that I wish that young Tim had had when he was figuring out who he was. And uh, it's not mine, I didn't create it, um, but I'm getting to make, you know, bring it into a, you know, a new life. And, uh, and it, I, I never, I never set out to change the business. I never set out to, to, to talk to young adolescent Tim, but I have found that as those opportunities are availing themselves, that they are the most rewarding thing I'm doing right now. They're the thing that I look forward to more than anything. And, uh, you know, I hope that, that I get to keep doing it. I hope we all get to keep, you know, doing these things that end up meaning so much to us and that the next group after us makes stuff that just blows our minds. Uh, <laughs> you know, that's what I'm looking forward to. It, it is also, it's a tough thing when it's, when you're not the creator, you know, not only are you dealing with, with other people's IP, but there's, you know, bigger dogs than you uh, in the room. So, you know, you, you know, the good thing is when you have a writer's room, which is rare in animation, um, very rare, <laughs> almost non-existent these days. But when you do, uh, you know, to be the lone queer voice in the room, um, I didn't think that I was going to have to push for things. <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't, nobody elected me, but I guess, you know, I suddenly found myself in, in, in different rooms um, you know, suddenly being the only voice, the only LGBTQ voice, and uh, realizing that uh, I had a, a responsibility to try at least to uh, to move the needle a little bit. Uh, I didn't I didn't expect it. Nobody elected me to it, but um, but it's something that I like. I said I found it's actually turned out to be one of the most rewarding things that I do now. So I'm happy about that. Great, thank you, Hazel. How about you? Uh, a lot of stuff self-published, so you may not have had some of these same types of experiences. But I am coming at it from a very a pretty different angle than I think a lot of other people on the panel. Although, again, you know, Nimona as a web comic also self-published, so that's a similarity. Uh, and it makes me really happy to hear about how everyone has gotten queer characters and themes into more mainstream media, sort of by hook or by crook, um, but yeah, I think readers and editors and whomever have always come to me expecting that I, I was would want to write about like queer and trans history or um, my experiences related to like sexuality and gender. So like, that's kind of what people are looking for from me or like was I guess my niche from the beginning which is great that it can be a niche you know that there even are like these queer specific grants and festivals and whatnot um but I think where I have encountered the most difficulty especially as I'm moving into graphic novels with other publishers um is I'm trying to do stuff that can be classified as YA because the reach for that is so big potentially um, and I have 
sometimes have difficulty with like people finding that if I like talked about my life as a teenager honestly and frankly that that isn't then considered appropriate for other teens to read about which is frustrating um you know i'm working on some more trans memoir stuff right now and um i'm not sure if i can be as frank as i want to be for teens when i'm talking about like dysphoria you know my relationship with my body sexual desires which like is such a huge component of it i want to shout out my friend maya kobabe's book gender queer a memoir uh yeah your memoir is really great he uses em era pronouns uh and like he was able to talk incredibly just frankly and openly about like your you know fantasies growing up relationship with your body and like i you know as a adult who's approximately the same age found that you know incredibly like informative and just relatable for that stuff not to be talked around um so but unfortunately that's classified as an adult book so i'm seeing how much frankness i'm going to be able to bring to the ya market um I also, I mean, I suppose this relates to being bisexual, but I've also encountered a lot of pushback in publishing with trying to be frank about my experiences as a teenager dating vastly older men. And, you know, those relationships were not healthy, but, um, you know, that's something that, like, I would like to show teens um but I think I encounter some pushback because maybe young Hazel wasn't a paragon of good behavior or you know I'm not exactly sure what all the reasons are but yeah so like that's what I've gotten more so than people not wanting to talk about me being queer is like they don't want me to talk about, I don't know, bad decisions that I made as a teenager, because I guess if teenagers don't read about that, then they'll just never get the idea in their head to do anything dumb. Uh, yeah, so, I'm not but sure it that's is a works. different world. <laughs> Sorry, what? I said, I'm not sure that's how that works. So I'm going to throw this out because it's kind of uh, references points that everybody has talked around a little bit, which is we're in a time right now, uh, we're, we're facing our own legion of doom <laughs> or evil horde, you know, where, but one of the ways we're adapting to it, and especially during the coronavirus epidemic, is that we're having conversations about these things in ways that we didn't have even a year ago. Um, we're having conversations about race, about consent, about um, gender, about um, privilege, uh, you know, and so forth. Um, is there something, and I'm going to throw this out to just anybody to answer, um, or everybody to answer, is there something in creating art that you think helps with that, with that kind of discussion? Um, Anybody? Well, I don't, you know, it's funny, all my life, I've always thought that we, too much, in, in, certainly in this country, but maybe all over the world, we look to, uh, you know, politicians and we think that, the, you know, the and legislation and uh, we think that, you know, the things change where, you know, based on, on what they do uh, or don't or not or what they don't do. But, you know, I, I was, I, I came out right before Will and Grace happened. And it's incredible, the world that we live in now, 
when, when the history book is, you know, written when we're a little bit further out, it's incredible that it, it's not the, 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 the politicians uh, who, who, may, who really make the change because the change starts in people's hearts. You know, you can't change people's minds until you change their hearts. And that's, the, that's where we go. That's what we, that's, that's our, that's our target. Um, and uh, so I think that that's what artists do. That's what art does. That's why what we do has to be important to at least to us, even if other people tell us it's, it's not important. We know, we know that it is. We know that the world that we live in now is a direct result of a sitcom, in many ways, of a sitcom about a gay guy and his, you know, gal friend living uh, in an apartment in New York. I mean, that's a, it, it's a, it's an oversimplification to just say it's all will and grace, but that's a good example of how the rest of the country, the rest of the world took this piece of art, arguably, and, uh, and, and it changed their hearts. And once that happens, we start to see things like the ruling that came down from the Supreme Court this very week that we're recording this, um, which, you know, finally, uh, uh, acknowledges that you cannot fire uh, LGBTQ people just for being LGBTQ. Um, incredible that we have lived uh, all this time without that recognized protection, but we do now. And I think it's a, it's a direct result of how we've changed. We as an industry uh, have changed people's hearts. It's what we do. I think it's, um, with, with Shira, I, I feel one thing that's very, can be very overwhelming, but also is a responsibility that I take really seriously and that I've gotten a lot out of is the fact that like there is this huge following of LGBT young people who see themselves on the show and in the characters and like are, are watching it because they relate to it in that personal way. And so it's interesting where like, again, I didn't come out until 2016. I'm a very, I'm this very relatively recent. Um, and so I, I still feel like a baby gay in almost every possible way. Um, but like, I remember, like, I remember like being in the Castro the day that like the Supreme Court ruled that marriage for everyone was legal across the nation. Like, and I remember what it was like before that. And I remember what it's like after that. And there are a lot of kids who are younger, who are maybe in their early teens or even younger who are watching Shira, who don't even remember the world before that passed. And so it's like, of course we can get married. Even I am just like, of course we can get married. Like it's, and it, every so often you just are like reminded that it's not a given, that it wasn't a given then. And it's still not even really a given now, but, what I love about that is that, like, th there are people who will never know or they'll never really understand how difficult it was to get to this place. And in a weird way, I sort of hope they, they don't know that again. I hope that doesn't happen again. I hope they don't need to, like, see that happen again in the world. Um, and so in a lot of ways, I try to take inspiration from them because I feel like, like every time, you know, we say, like, look, here's a gay character, here's a gay relationship, here's a gay storyline. And they're like, oh great, now more. Give us more please, and better, and different, and this and that and that. And I'm like, but I, did, I worked really hard for this. But it's like, you're, we're never gonna get comfortable because there's no end to this journey. We have to keep pushing, we have to keep getting better, we have to keep getting to those people who have that clear view of the future, because we do have a huge responsibility. Like we show the world the way it can be. And it's limited by our imaginations and by our own limitations, but it doesn't mean we should stop trying. And so I think that like, you know, staying, like, I feel like it's a huge privilege and also a huge responsibility to be in this position because there is still a lot, like, there will be times when I don't understand. I don't understand something that's going on among like a younger group uh, in the LGBT community. And it's like, this is the time to listen. This is the time to pay attention because these people are gonna be who's taking it the next step. And so it's, you know, it's something that I think about constantly. And I, and I hope that, I hope that the world, like I hope in five, 10 years, it's unrecognizable all over again. And that like what we're making now is like, it, it's just a, a step in that stairway. And that what we will be capable of is something that we almost can't conceive of now because we just have to keep going and, and getting better and trying to dream 
bigger and better things about the world we share. Yay. Thank you, Noel. We're going to wrap up now because Comic-Con did give us a, uh, a time limit. So uh, real quickly, I'd like each of you uh, to talk about um, what exciting projects are you working on for the future, if you can tell us, or at least hint at. Um, do they include LGBTQ content? And, um, uh, and if, you, if you can do it quickly, give us you know, one other project of, by somebody else that you might want to plug in the LGBTQ community. So we're going to start with Chris. Um, I'm working on something I can't talk about, so that's that. But then there is something that I'm hoping to return to soon, and that's uh, right after I left Marvel, I started doing my own independent online LGBTQ comic called uh, Queer Nation. And that was tremendous fun. It was um, basically about what happens when a comic passes too close to the earth. And it's lambda rays because all the gay people on the planet to suddenly develop superpowers. Meanwhile, a right wing white nationalist has taken over the United States in the presidency. This was what I was writing this back in 98, 2000. And I thought, oh, this could never happen in real life. So um, I'm hoping to get back to Queer Nation. We got about a quarter of the way through the story when I had to mothball it simply because I had my own things going on. And now um, I'm hoping to be able to return to that and bring Queer Nation back. And in the meantime, you're going to keep fighting the Karens, right? <laughs> Always. <laughs> Always fight Karens. Fight Karens and punch Nazis. <laughs> All right. Uh, Noel, how about you? Uh, I also cannot announce just yet what my next project is. Maybe by the time this panel comes out, it will be announced. So if you're watching this and you know what it is, good job. You, you <laughs> figured it out. You know. I hope the future is nice and less scary than where we are now. Um, but yeah, I, it's uh, something that's really close to my heart. And um, I'm really excited to be able to return to it. Ooh, that's a hint. I think that's a hint. <laughs> Thank you, Noel. Uh, Tim, how about you? Uh, mostly can't talk about anything, but um, <laughs> I, uh, I can uh, say that I just listened to a podcast that if you haven't listened to it, everybody should listen to called The Two Princes. That is a, um, a, just a, an incredible uh, myth, uh, sort of in the style of a Disney story about uh, two, two princes who um, uh, fall in love to save their kingdoms. And it is, uh, uh, it just, it rocked my world. I thought it was really cool. So everybody should, should pay attention to that. Um, I, and since I'm not plugging anything uh, right now, what I do want to say is before we leave this panel is, we, we, I mean, we all have a laugh about the Karen fighting, but you know, I, Chris, I never met you uh, before uh, today. And um, you know, th that woman called the police um, you know, and we all have been seeing the, the, the terrible things that happen, that can happen to uh, someone who looks like you when the police are called and lied to and the things that, that, that we saw happen, we all saw happen. And I just want to say that after this uh, panel, I'm just like so happy to have met you. And I'm so happy that we still have you to keep telling stories and keep paving the way for the next group to come up after you. So, uh, you know, good on you and uh, keep fighting. And I'm so, so glad uh, to have met you and that you're here. Well, Tim, that's really sweet. Thank you very much. That is, that's very nice. Uh, all right, Hazel, how about you? All right, I think the lesson there is don't call the police and instead redirect those resources. Uh, <laughs> the next thing that I have coming out is, um, my friend Sarah Merck wrote a journalistic comic called Guantanamo Voices, which is based on her interviews with Guantanamo uh, detainees mostly, but also other people who have been involved in the prison system there. It's coming out from Abrams in September, I think. And I drew two chapters of that, which I'm really proud of. And as far as plugging other queer comics, I want to plug the anthology Abo Comics, uh, which is edited by Io Ascarium. I can't remember the name of the other co-editor, but they're on, I think, their third 
anthology now and they publish all comics by queer prisoners. They've got some sort of pen pal situation set up and um, you know when it comes to broadening representation in comics I think the most important question is who even has the time and the resources and the platform to be um, telling their own stories and um, I think that it's super cool that Avro Comics is doing that and you know we need to think giving resources to the most marginalized creators and uh, getting their work out there. All right, thank you, Hazel. Uh, since I'm a moderator, I get last word on that, which is um, I actually am returning to comics some myself. I've got six graphic novels for young adults that I've written for Abdo Books. They have not been announced yet officially, but uh, I've been told I can talk about them, called Fractured Fairy Tales. And they are modern takes on, you know, old time fairy tales, but they're very much set in the modern world uh, with the magic of the modern world being the magic. Uh, and one of the great joys of working on this project has been the ability to, uh, that the publisher has supported me in allowing me to have all different colors. Uh, I've had characters with disabilities in every single one of the stories. I've had characters of different religious beliefs. I've had LGBTQ characters. It's been really um, exciting to write these books that are meant for young adults and to not have much pushback really in terms of what can be said for a young old adult audience. So I'm really excited about those and those will be coming up soon. Uh, I want to thank each of the panelists for your time. Uh, we want to thank Comic-Con at Home for uh, allowing us to do this panel. And uh, I'd like you all to remind you all, please be kind to each other, register to vote, uh, wash your hands, um, heroes wear masks, <laughs> and keep filming Karens and punching Nazis when it's appropriate. And with that, Chris, Tim, Noel, Hazel, thank you very much. This has been Out in Comics Year 33. Bye, everybody. Bye. Lovely to talk to you all. Thank you. Thank you.